I had a, an 18 year career. I started at, when I was 15 at Halifax. And in 98, I transferred to, over to uh, Salford Reds and stayed there then. And luckily enough for me, I represented Great Britain Academy and uh, Wales uh, in World Cups. And yeah, I retired in 2009, I think it was. And, you know, I thought I was one of the smart guys. You know, I went back to university, got myself a degree, um, and set up a business. But what I wasn't prepared for was that kind of loss of structure, that loss of identity. Um, you know, I, th I went from being Paul, the rugby player, to just Paul, in my mind. You know, all my friends and family didn't care. You know, they, they only ever knew me as Paul, but for me, that was a that was a big thing. And, you know, being with 30 of your best friends every day, to them working on my own. You know, we had Mad Monday on the, on the, the last Monday, we played on the Sunday, Mad Monday on the Monday, Tuesday I was sat on my city thinking, is this it? You know, is this it for the rest of my life? You know, it, it slowly sort of built up from there really. You know, the dark thoughts started to kick in a little bit and I got to the point where I kind of split up with my missus. Um, I'd found myself putting a deposit on a cottage in the middle of the saddle of Moors and just sort of isolating myself. You know, I, I stopped seeing friends, family, I stopped going out, I stopped started letting people down, saying I'd be somewhere and not turn up. Um, and, you know, it got to the point where friends, family were getting really worried. Um, I got to the point where, you know, suicidal thoughts were, were a daily occurrence and, you know, certainly out, out wasn't out of the realms of possibility. It, it got to one Friday, Friday morning, and I woke up again, you know, feeling terrible, looking terrible. Um, you know, my... At this point, I was I was taking a lot of prescription drugs um, from the injuries that I was taking, but I was kind of abusing these these drugs at the time. And as I said, the suicidal thoughts was, was were, were heavy. You know, they were there all the time. And I just remember one Friday, just deciding, you know, that was it. I wanted to be out of here. And it was a failed attempt. It was, uh, you know, I, I got drunk and I fell asleep and didn't go through with what I was what I was going to do. And that was the wake up call. That was the, you know, I nearly left the kids without a dad. You know, my parents without a, a son and brother without a brother. And, you know, the, the, the sort of thought of that was like a sledgehammer to the side of my head. And that really was the sort of the catalyst to, to getting sorted. And, and luckily for me, my parents had made a call to the RFL, unbeknowing to myself, because the day after I made the same call to Emma Rosewan, um, who was the, the welfare director. And basically just, I asked for some help. Uh, and I was put in touch with the Sporting Chance um, and I sent them an email basically just asking for help and by nine the following morning I was in a hotel room in, in the middle of Leeds telling Colin Bland who's the, the CEO of the of the charity just my, some of my deepest darkest secrets you know stuff that was really you know really I thought it was going to take to the grave with me you know if I can put back one little smidgen you know to what these guys are, have given me it's, it's worth everything and you know being the player welfare manager now at Salford Red Devils it's uh, you know, it's a pleasure for me to give them everything I didn't really get as a player. You know, I got a lot of um, help when things went wrong. But up until that point, I wasn't really aware of what was out there. There probably was stuff, but we had nobody like me to be able to bang that drum for Emma at the RFL, who was tirelessly working behind the scenes, but didn't have that sort of voice to be able to spread the word. And for me to be able to give these guys, you know, not only my experience, but, you know, my time and attention like I said, like, like we didn't get, you know, it's invaluable because, you know, I, I only see the problems increasing now for these guys, you know, the training times have dropped compared to what we do and the money's gone up, so they've got a lot more spare time, a lot more spare money. And, you know, problems, societal problems are, are, are increasing all the time. And, you know, from a, from a sport that is perceived to be such a, you know, such a rough, tough sport, as I said, for us to be able to stand up and say, you know what, I'm struggling. I'm not dealing with this very well. It makes it normal. It makes it all right for other people and other men to be able to step up and, and talk. And I think that's what all these projects that we're all getting involved in now are helping to break down those stigmas. And, you know, the more we can get out there and, and spread that word, I think the stigma can only, only be shrunk over time. And, you know, that's ultimately our, our aim with all this.